Well, hello, everybody. How is it going today? It is uh, the second day of spring, I believe, checking the old calendar there. And we have got an amazing show for you here at the Green Thumb Lecture sh lecture Series, uh, brought to you, of course, in part by the Harris County Public Library, and most importantly, the Master Gardeners of Harris County. Uh, this is the Green Thumb Lecture Series. And today, uh, our show is Benefits of Growing Native Plants. So we've got a really good speaker. We're very excited about that. Um, uh, one thing I want to do, a couple of housekeeping uh, uh, notes real quick. We have people uh, monitoring questions right now. So if you have a question as we are doing our presentation, please, please feel free. Type that in the comment section. Uh, type that in and uh, we will have uh, we have master gardeners uh, who are answering that as well as. Uh, uh, we'll be looking at those. We'll also pause for questions in the, mid of the middle of the presentation and at the end of the presentation as well. Uh, so we definitely welcome those questions. We are here every Tuesday, every third Tuesday uh, of the month at 11 a.m. right here on uh, Facebook and StreamYard and YouTube and the Harris County Master Gardener site and all those places. Now then, let's get this uh, started. Uh, let's see if we can uh, we let you guys know that that's going. We um, have a very special guest here today. Uh, this gentleman is um, Mr. Robin Kendrick Yates. Uh, he was a physician's assistant with a master's degree from Nebraska Medical Center, Omaha, Nebraska, retired from MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center about uh, after 20 years of a career in pain management. Although his career was extremely rewarding, uh, he found out that he was a little burned out, as you can imagine he would be. Um, and he found healing in gardening uh, with plants that are native to the greater Houston area. So with that, uh, it is a real pleasure to introduce Mr. Robin. Hey, how are you doing today, Robin? I'm great, John. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. And once again, I want to remind everybody that we have, um, if you have questions, um, please go ahead and um, get those to us. Uh, start thinking about them, about your native plant questions. And uh, you know what? I, I know we got a lot to cover. So um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let you take over here uh, whenever you are ready, Mr. Robin. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, John. Welcome, and thank you for taking time to talk about one of my favorite topics, gardening with native plants. I'm a retired physician assistant who became a master gardener in 2021. I have a lot of things to tell you, and above all, I hope to pique your interest, your curiosity, to adopt, to adopt at least one thing from our time together today. The good news is that you, today, can make a positive impact on the environment and your own quality of life. We'll talk about how to do that. I have taken all the photos in this presentation from my phone. Uh, most of the plants are from my yard. Next slide, please. This is the calendar for our 2023 Green Thumb Gardening Series. Uh, please note the upcoming talk next month on tips for great lawns. Next slide. Before we get started, I would like to invite you to join us at the Harris County Master Gardeners Genoa Friendship demonstration garden this Saturday for a workshop. We will discuss how to propagate native plants, identify and collect seed, how to transfer seedlings, and we'll actually put some native wildflowers in the new pollinator bed that's being built. How cool is that? More on this later. Next slide. First, I would like to acknowledge the native people who inhabited this land for thousands of years coexisting with these native plants that we'll be talking about sustainably. The Ekokisa, Karankawa, and others were displaced. Many lost their lives, the land, as well as their culture was taken from them. I would like to honor them by opening the discussion on facing the wrongs done in the past and moving toward healing and restoration in the here and now. Next slide, please. Many of the concepts I'll be talking about are referenced in this website, the EarthKind AgriLife Extension, EarthKind Landscaping website. You'll find resources there for things such as landscaping, plant selection, composting, rainwater harvesting, and much more. This link will be placed in the chat window for your future use by our wonderful Master Gardener volunteers, my colleagues, Lisa and Aida. Thank you all for your help. Next slide, please. So today we'll be covering, first of all, the definition of what is a native plant. Then we'll talk about a number of the benefits of native plants in your yard. 
and then some actions that you can actually do today. Then where to find them? Throughout this talk, we'll be giving you resources, and then we'll have several times for question and answers. So please, as John mentioned, put your questions in the chat and we'll get to them. And then I will introduce you to some friends of mine, some examples of native plants. Next slide, please. So first of all, definition. A native plant, according to the Native Plant Society of Texas, is one that evolved and occurs naturally with no human intervention in a region or environment. And that's present prior to Euro-American settlement. I like to think of ourselves, or, or we, as a culture, we think of ourselves often as separate from nature. We tend to keep nature over there and our lives over here. Yet think about this, when we wanted to fly, where did we look? The Wright brothers, they observed the birds, the shape of the wing and the way that they were built. They observed them. And also when we learn how to swim, we look at fish. So I suggest to you that a more accurate view would be that really nature are us, to make a play on the old stores, toys are us, babies are us. Whether you believe we're evolved or we're created, we actually are a part of nature. We are an integral part of our ecosystem. We should be mindful of our impact on that system. Next slide, please. So I'm going to ask you to put on a different pair of glasses when looking for plants to put in your yard. When we go to the nursery for flowers, shrubs, trees, ground covers, what questions are usually in the front of our mind? Well, cost, color, size when mature, how much maintenance? Will it last through a drought, through a freeze? Is it the soil? What kind of soil does it need? How much sun, how much water? Will the HOA approve of it? What will my neighbors think? And on and on and on. I have another question that I'd like for you to pose, to consider. Next slide, please. When I go to the nursery, I look for the insects, okay? John will be pointing out on the cursor here that salvia on the left, there's a bee, and then on the sunflower, Helianthus anus, and the purple coneflower, there are pollinators. These are all in my yard. And so when I go to the nursery, I look for the insects, the butterflies, the bees, wasps, moths, dragonflies. Why is that? Why does that crazy guy do that? Next slide, please. You may have heard that we are in the midst of what scientists are calling a mass extinction event. 21 species were removed from the endangered species list September of 2021. Not because they recovered, but they're gone, folks. Nobody has seen them for decades. And some scientists estimate that we will lose 1 million species by 2050. We're losing them before we can even identify them. That's a reality. Next slide, please. The next two books I would like you to consider if you're interested in this topic, Dr. Douglas Talame, he's an entomologist at the University of Delaware, researcher, and he authored these two as well as other books, but these two have been really insightful for me. As native plants evolve simultaneously over millennia, that is thousands of years, with the insects and other wildlife, those plants provide the habitat those species need and require for survival. Our ecosystem, the one we live here in Harris County in the greater Houston area, depends upon the insects, pollinators and others to survive. Most songbirds raise their young by feeding them caterpillars. That was news for me. When I read that in Bringing Nature Home, that was a wake up call. I thought they were feeding them nuts and berries and seeds and things. No, no, no. Little baby birds can't tolerate those foods. They take the caterpillars. It can take thousands of caterpillars to raise one clutch of chickadees, according to Talamay's research. By placing a native plant in your garden and your yard, you're helping the entire ecosystem. And that's good for everyone. What other benefits are there? Next slide, please. Less is more. Less time less money, less water, less maintenance. 
and less or no chemicals. When I say chemicals, I mean synthetic chemicals, herbicide, insecticide, fungicide, fertilizer. Okay, if you notice those first three all have C-I-D-E at the end, that means death. Those things kill. And so we're in the middle of a mass extinction, and part of the reason is we are killing the environment. And so the native plants do not require anything more once they're established than rainfall, the local rainfall. Thus, there's less maintenance, time, and expense. There's less runoff pollution in our waterways. And you may have heard about the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. The fancy word is called eutrophication. Uh, that's due to agricultural and land use nutrient runoff. If you don't broadcast your chemicals correctly, and it's easy to not do it correctly, it will be it will turn into runoff and goes into the waterway. So native plants help because they require much less of all of that. What about native plants and extremes of weather? Next slide, please. These plants are survivors, folks. You can think of them as champions. Over millennia, they developed and outcompeted other plants to be here today. Natives have a survival advantage here. I don't know about you, but I want all the help I can get for my plants to survive, okay? And I think you probably do too. So native plants are made, they're, they're tailored to this area. So how else do native plants benefit our yards? Next slide, please. Here in the Houston area, we don't just have rain, we have rain events. We have lots of water in a short span of time. And where can it go? Uh, daily, we see new green areas being bulldozed over and pavement put down. Parking lots turned into lots. Where can the water from rain events go? Well, what do we do? Humans, we have developed what we call in the Houston area is the Bayou City. We channelize the bayous. That means we make them deeper, wider, and straighter. We want that water to get out of here, <laughs> okay? But what does nature do? If you look at nature, nature will spread out the water, slow it down with vegetation, and soak it in. And how do they soak it in? Next slide, please. This slide demonstrates, this is a drawing uh, done in 1995, and it's an amazing drawing. It shows you the roots of native prairie plants. You can see these are measured in feet. This area used to be coastal tall grass prairie. There's only 1% of that, or actually less than 1% of that left. These plants create channels through the ground for the water to infiltrate back into the aquifer, okay? These are native plants. Two thirds of their life is actually underground. These are things we don't see. Now look at all those native plants. Now I'd like to draw your attention to the left-hand side. See that very small little patch? That is turf grass, folks. That's either Bermuda, St. Augustine, Zosia, other lawn turf grasses shallow root system. Which do you think is going to help us more in a flood? Next slide, please. The, the deep root system also helps with water conservation. Uh, plants will filter the water, the rainwater, and any pollutants that are collected in it. It cleans the water before it re-enters the water cycle. And who doesn't want cleaner water? So instead of worsening water quality by runoff chemicals, native plants actually make the water better. Another benefit of the deep root system is, next slide, please. Because uh, native plants evolved here, I'm sorry, I think I missed one slide. Let's go back to the previous one. Can you do that, John? I meant to say one more thing about conservation. Thank you. Uh, because native plants evolved here in this ecosystem, they will survive on local rainfall once established. This decreases uh, supplemental watering needs, an important consideration as fresh water is a limited resource. And next slide. One more. 
Perfect, thank you. How do plants take carbon from the atmosphere and put it in the ground? You may have heard about carbon sequestration. This was new for me, I learned this recently. So plants by photosynthesis take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they store it in the roots. Then when the plant dies for an annual or becomes dormant for a perennial, the root recedes and that root that is no longer active decomposes and it becomes a soil organic compound. That's how carbon is taken from the atmosphere by plants and put into the soil. So that helps with climate change. Next slide, please. Texas A&M has some ongoing research regarding carbon sequestration and agriculture uh, improvements. That's a cool thing. So are there other benefits of using native plants in my yard? Next slide, please. Improved air quality, not only through the photosynthesis we were just talking about, as all plants do, but due to less maintenance. We pollute our atmosphere by using gas burning mowers, edgers, and leaf blowers. You may be aware that these machines are not regulated by the EPA. They pollute the air 30 to 100 times more than automobile engines, which have to meet strict air standards. In addition, on Saturday morning, my alarm clock is the leaf blower from the workers. These are noisy machines, so there is noise pollution involved as well. And then another factor, I learned about this uh, when listening to the January talk by Deborah Caldwell. I encourage you to go back to that. We'll put the link to our previous Green Thumb lectures, but she talked about the soil food web and soil compaction. These workers and these heavy machines compact the soil and that decreases the air that's actually 25% of what our soil is. And so it makes the soil not as healthy. So native plants do not require all of this maintenance. Next slide, please. Another benefit of native plants, and this is one that I love, is that they provide a sense of place and connection. Stress relief, interaction with nature has proven to reduce anxiety and depression. Many of my neighbors tell me they smile when they walk past our yard as there are flowers blooming in every season. We actually need nature because again, nature are us. Many of us have found spending time in nature an effective strategy for dealing with the difficulties of the pandemic. Native plants literally bring nature to your doorstep. All I need to do to relax out in nature is step outside. Well, we've talked about a number of benefits of native plants. What can we do? Next slide, please. Three things, and you can work on these starting today. For any plant that either has died through the winter or through the frost, or if you need a new plant to replace, plant a native. Consider a native tree understory, shrub, wildflower, or ground cover. It doesn't have to be a, a big, just start with one and start with a small little area, maybe an area that's not already growing well with your turf grass, transition it to a native bed. B, plant with wildlife in mind, organically, without chemicals at the nursery, follow the butterflies. And then C, compost. This is actually easier than it sounds and it's not as difficult. It really, and we have talks about that and we'll be happy to talk with you about it. But yard and kitchen waste becomes 20 to 30% of the landfill garbage that we send to the curb. I recommend leaving the leaves and consider it nature's blanket. Next slide, please. So what do you see here? Yard waste leaves, grass clippings. These are from my neighborhood last winter. Why is it on the curb? Where is it going? To a landfill. What will happen to it there? Is that the only choice? Is that the best choice? Next slide, please. I suggest we are throwing away money, soil fertilizer, compost neutralizer, carbon, and we're throwing away a blanket for our plants. I consider 
leaves to be nature's blanket. The benefits are there's less waste to the landfill. You may have heard Sam Houston National Forest, which is just north of us, is being threatened by placing a landfill right next to it. Yeah. And so there's less methane. These objects turn into some very lethal gases, methane being one of them, which is more uh, difficult for the atmosphere to deal with than carbon dioxide. What is, happens with this leaves, if you use them in your yard, it becomes a natural mulch. It protects plants' roots in drought, it protects the roots from the heat, from the freeze, weed suppression. It reduces soil erosion. It actually fertilizes the soil, returns the nutrients back to the soil, decreases how much fertilizer you need to buy. Wildlife habitat. It actually becomes a place where moths, butterflies, and other critters can lay their eggs and can shelter and multiply. And also, in the right-hand corner, another benefit I didn't know, your grand dog may enjoy sniffing the leaves. So you may ask, where can I find native plants? Next slide, please. So here's a number of links. I'm just going to review these briefly, and my friends will post these in the chat for you, these links. At the Genoa Friendship Garden that I was mentioning at the greenhouse, we often will have these plants for sale. They'll vary based upon the time of the year and which plants that I've been able to propagate. Uh, the second one is Audubon's Native Nursery at Edith Elmore Sanctuary. I recommend checking this place out because they have the real deal. They have local native plants that evolve within 50 miles of the Houston area. So you're you're sure to get a native if you go there. Also, the Native Plant Society of Texas has a number of chapters locally, the Houston, Montgomery, Fort Bend, Clear Lake, and there are others around us. They each have spring and typically fall plant sales. Those are a good place to go. And then some of the nurseries, Buchanan's Native Plants, Morning Star Native Plants. When you go to another nursery, be sure and ask, is this a native? Because it might be a a hybrid, it might be a cultivar, and that may not be the same benefit as a native plant. The good news is any native you put in your yard or garden helps. Start with just one. You don't have to make big changes. Start small and observe. I encourage you to decrease the size of your ecologically dead zone, the lawn or turf grass. Plant a native tree, especially an oak or put a native wildflower bed underneath it. For further reading on this, I recommend Doug Talamay's books that we brought out to you earlier, Bringing Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope. And then consider putting your yard on his homegrown national park map. Next slide, please. So please come and visit us Monday and Wednesday mornings at the Genoa Friendship Garden. I love to show the native plant landscaping bed that I've just been building to folks and talk about how you can incorporate the natives in your own yard. Next slide, please. This is the map of Houston and uh, John is circling there. That's where the Genoa Friendship Garden is right on the Beltway, just inside the Beltway, Genoa Friendship Garden. Next slide, please. Up in the top left corner is the little mound where I was given the opportunity to build a bed, which you can see in the middle. I'm standing there. This was just about a week ago. It's just starting some of the plants to bloom. I'd love to show them to you. On the right-hand side is one of my colleagues, Noe Tristan, who helped me put in the irrigation. And so there are many other master gardeners that you'll find there and happy to answer your questions. Next slide, please. Speaking of questions, now is the time, if you have any, all right. Uh, uh, yes. We'll tell you what. We've had some technical difficulties, I believe, on the Facebook page, so I'm not sure. I think sometimes uh, some of the people who might be viewing this um, will be viewing it a little bit later, but we do have some questions, and I definitely have some questions. Um, uh, my first question, so you're talking about insects and how the ecosystem depends on the insects. I got to ask, I mean, what Houston is known for more than anything else, roaches. Uh, is that a – where do they fit into the picture, and is it still <clears> – <throat> <laughs> Okay, so I'm not an entomologist, okay? First of all, all right? I'm just going to give you my perspective as a gardener. The roaches actually have a place, and they have a place in decomposing. They help with the compost. 
there are roaches out in the compost. I keep that back in the back corner of my backyard. And I'm happy to see roaches there because they're breaking that compost down. And so they have a place, right? And so I recommend doing whatever you need to do inside your dwelling to keep the insects out. I'm totally down with that, okay? Yeah. Don't use the insecticides out in your yard because then you'll kill the wildlife. So if, we, if me and the roaches can just come with an agreement, like they stay outside, I'll stay inside. I'll give them the food they need. All right, that works out. You got it. Uh, that sounds good. Um, another question I was had. This came in from uh, uh, Lisa. Uh, what are some good ground covers to replace grass in shade area, and where can they be purchased? Okay, that's an excellent question. I'll be addressing that more in detail next month with the tips for great lawns. But for shade area, yes, that is a good challenge. Pigeonberry, okay, is one. And I don't have pictures of that. It's not in my slides that are coming up. But pigeonberry is a good ground cover. And I, that's going to be demonstrated at the Genoa Friendship Garden. It's also in our perennial garden. So pigeonberry is a good shade tolerant ground cover also horse herb which most people probably have in their yard or nearby in a ditch and i'll show you i can help you identify that as well those are two good shade covers and then one of the grasses i'm going to show the very last <clears throat> grass that i'll show uh, inland sea oats is great ground cover for shade area and it's a larval host for multiple skipper butterflies good oh, question great. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, and the other thing that really uh, struck me in your presentation so far is about carbon capture. I, uh, you know, it's been so much in the news now. You know, when you think of like all these carbon capture plants and all these things, we're all the things we're doing uh, to build these big, uh, uh, large facilities to capture carbon, and uh, you just don't think about it that that's kind of what the plants are doing the the whole time. I mean, that that they were so effective at that. So uh, right. So we can actually do something today, exactly, John, in our own yard, consider our own yard part of the answer to climate change, exactly. Yeah, and then of course, uh, and the noise pollution is worth, I, th I think every uh, weekend, uh, uh, they have a competition for the world's loudest leaf blower outside of, uh, outside of our window, so. I'm sure they do. <laughs> And they and they're 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 hard competitors. They want to win. So <laughs> they do, they do, and they're really good at it. <laughs> All right. Well, people, tell you what, if you keep the questions coming in. We will get to those. But I want to get. I know we've got a lot more to cover. So why don't we go ahead and get back into it, if we could, and uh, uh, we'll let you. We'll come back. We'll do more questions at the end. Cool. Please do bring your questions. We're happy to answer them. And so now I get the most enjoyable part of my talk is to talk about some of my friends. These are friends that have helped me through the pandemic, uh, literally. And so I want to introduce you to some of them. So firewheel or blanket flower, Gallardia pocella is the scientific name. This, as well as many of these plants, does best in full sun. It will bloom basically in the Houston area. It can bloom all year long, February through December. It's an annual. It will reseed itself if you let the flowers go to seed. Pollinators adore it, and it's easy to grow and propagate. I have rescued this from near Ellington Field, and now all that area is paved over, and those plants are gone. So I'm thankful that I was able to rescue some of this. Next slide, please. This is one of my friends, Black-Eyed Susan, Brown-Eyed Susan, Rudbeckia herta is a scientific name. This was my gateway plant into native plants. You can see that left-hand photo is around my mailbox. That's how I started, just with a little two-foot square around my mailbox. I put some baby Black-Eyed Susans in there a few years ago, and that's where I got started loving native plants. Pollinators love its nectar. It blooms is again, full sun, it does best in full sun. It will grow in dappled sun. Blooms May to November. Pollinators love its nectar. It's a larval host plant to the bordered patch and the gorgon checker spot butterflies. Birds love the seed. It's easy to propagate. And it will grow from one single plant and it will expand into what I call a colony or a cluster of flowers. Very beautiful plant. And it blooms all summer long through the heat. Next slide, please. You can't talk about native plants without talking about our state flower. Now, I love this flower, and that's why it's here. <laughs> Texas blue bonnet, Lupinus texanus. It is not native to this local area, though. 
if you look, it's actually more central Texas, okay, in the uh, hill country. Yet, I have it in my yard, and I have it in the native landscaping bed, and it's all throughout our, our Genoa Friendship Garden. It does best in full sun. It's an annual. It will reseed. If it's new to your yard, it may, you may require rhizobium. It's a soil-borne bacteria which forms nitrogen nodules. You can buy that from the nursery if the soil is new to a lupinus species. It's beautiful. Something folks don't recognize is that it's very fragrant. If you bend down to sniff it, make sure there's no critters down there first, okay? Uh, it provides nectar for the pollinators and is the larval host plant for elfin and hair streak butterflies. Next slide, please. Lebo Lemon bee balm, Monarda citriodora, is one of my favorite plants to watch for pollinators. It does best in full sun. It's aromatic. It has a citrus type odor to it when you rub your hands across it. It's easy to grow. The blooms are pink to lavender. It blooms from May through July, and pollinators love it. I have seen as many as four different species of bees on one plant. They like the frolic all over this. Thank you. Next slide. This is another one of my beautiful favorite plants. Purple coneflower, Echinacea purpurea. It does best in full sun. It's a perennial. And so it'll have a rosette that'll maintain through the winter. It grows to two to three feet with a bloom that's pink or purple in April through September. It's a nectar source for pollinators, as you can see provides seed for birds through the winter. So I don't cut it down in the fall. I leave it up through the winter. It's the larval host plant for the silvery checker spot. And we're blessed in Houston that we have two growing seasons. I have had uh, this plant bloom in the spring, go to seed, and then it'll have a baby that'll come up and bloom in the fall. We are fortunate to have that long growing season here in Houston. Next slide, please. This is another one of my favorite plants, Butterfly Gora, Onethera linhameri. It does best in full sun to part shade. It grows two feet up to five feet tall, and it can lean over, so it's good to have it, give it some room. The blooms are white to pink. It blooms from April through July. It's a nectar source, and here's what I love. I love to watch this plant because it has thin stalks. You can only see the flowers from a distance, and when a pollinator particularly a bee lands on it, it dips. And so it looks like, really, it looks like fairies. It looks just like Tinkerbell going up and down, the bees having fun, taking the nectar from it. This plant is named after Ferdinand Jacob Lindheimer, 1801 through 1879, who was often called the father of Texas botany. Next slide, please. The next, we had a question about uh, ground covers. This is one of the first that I recommend for covering the ground. This would be best in full sun. Pink evening primrose, Anethera speciosa. You may have seen this in the roadside ditches or in fields. It does best in full sun to part shade. It grows to one to two feet. Again, it's a good ground cover. Turf grass alternative for a section. It's a perennial, pink to white. February through July is when it blooms. And it's a nectar source for pollinators, seed birds, and seed for birds and mammals. And it's a larval host plant for several different moths. Next slide, please. Next one is powder puff, sensitive plant, mimosa strigolosa. This is also a good ground cover. It's low growing, maximum of one foot, full sun to part shade, and it's a legume, which means it fixes nitrogen in your soil, decreases your need for fertilizing. It has a beautiful pink bloom, and it blooms March through August, and you can see pollinators love to visit this plant. Next slide, please. Speaking of ground covers, this is my one of my heroes, frog fruit, phyla natiflora. You can see the comparison between St. Augustine on the left on that bottom hand photo and then frog fruit on the right. It's a little taller because that other lawn was scalped, but the frog fruit goes uh, six inches at maximum a foot, but the pollinators love it. Uh, it. It does best in full sun to part shade. It is both drought and flood tolerant. The little white blooms, 
go from May through November in just about any soil type. It's a nectar source for pollinators of all species. I'll see all kind of different pollinators out in this field when it's blooming. It's a larval host plant for three butterflies, y'all. Phaon, Crescent Spot, Buckeye, and the White Peacock. And I don't know a turf grass that could match that. Next slide, please. Next is an understory, beautiful plant, American Beautyberry, Calicarpa Americana. It does best in full shade or part shade, but it will also grow in full sun. It's a good understory layer. It's a layer we often forget or neglect in our landscapes. And it's an, a layer that's necessary for the wildlife. It's a perennial shrub, grows to five feet. The blooms are white to pink May through July, and then they turn to green berries which in turn in August and September turns iridescent purple. It's like magic it goes white, pink, green, purple. I, I love this. It's a nectar source. The seed is food for birds. And some people even uh, make the berries into jam. We're getting into canning and that may be something that we'll be doing this year. Next slide, please. The salvia family is one of my favorites for pollinators. Scarlet sage, tropical sage, Salvia coccinia is a native. It does best in the full sun, but it also goes in, grows in shade. One to three feet tall. It's an annual, perennial, and it, the blooms can be red, white, or pink. And it blooms pretty much all year, February through October, November. It's a nectar source for pollinators, including hummingbirds. Hummers love this. The red draws their attention. Next slide, please. The next flower is one that grows fairly tall, uh, American basket flower, Centauria americana. It does best in full sun to part shade, and it grows from one and a half to six feet tall. The bloom, as you can see, is pink to lavender, and it blooms February through August. And pollinators just love this. These bees look like I did when I was playing in the leaves as a child. They just roll around in it. And they just have a great time. It's fun to watch them. Next slide, please. I'd like to introduce you to a couple of grasses. Again, these are just a sampling of plants. There's over 200 native plants that the Native Plant Society of Texas recommends for landscaping in our area, but I only have a few minutes, so I just want to introduce you to a few of these. And most of these are demonstrated in the Genoa Friendship Garden. So this is Little Blue Stem, Shizacrium scoparium. It's one of the four major coastal tall grass prairie grasses. It does best in full sun to part shade. It's a perennial bunch grass. It grows two to three, excuse me, two to three feet tall. And it, uh, the, the blue-green stems, you can see on the left-hand side, turn to a radiant mahogany red by September with fuzzy white seeds attractive to birds over the winter. It provides nesting material, and it's a larval host for many skipper butterflies. Next slide, please. Then we had a <clears throat> a specific question about ground cover for shade, this is one. Inland sea oats, Chesbanthium latifolium. It propagates very easily on its own. Uh, low maintenance shade grass, part shade to shade. It grows two to four feet tall. Blue green bamboo like leaves and oat like sea heads, which gracefully arch toward yellow and then turn golden, yellow golden brown in the fall. It does well in most soils, medium water requirements. The seeds are eaten by birds and small mammals. The stems and leaves become nesting material for birds. And it's a larval host for three of the skipper butterflies. Next slide, please. Anytime we talk about natives, it's, it's helpful to understand that there are invasive plants such as Japanese honeysuckle, uh, Ligustrum nandina, Chinese tallow, Chinese wisteria and others, the Native Plant Society has a link to more information on them. But whenever these plants that can end up in our yard, uh, whenever they escape our yard, they become alien invaders and they establish in new areas and quickly spread out of control. They hoard light, water and nutrients and can alter entire ecosystems by displacing the native species. Next slide, please. So we've reviewed all of this and we've done it in good time. Next slide, please. 
So I'd like to remind you again of next month, we'll be talking about tips for great lawns and I'll be talking on alternatives to turf grass in that as well. Next slide, please. And then please uh, consider joining us for our workshop. Participants will go home with at least one and likely two or more native plants. I will also have reusable shopping bags. I collect different bags and I like to give them away to folks who come to my workshops because that's a part of a circular economy that I like to encourage. And also I'll be there on Mondays and Wednesday mornings with them. And so please come, love to see you. Next slide, please. And we're open for questions. Absolutely, absolutely. Let me go ahead and uh, pull this off here. I want to make sure they get the, uh, the information down there. Man, uh, I've got a few questions. We've had a couple of good comments come in. Uh, by the way, Kathy, I uh, wanted to shout out. She said how much she loves the program. Uh, and awesome. uh, also, we want to point out that questions can keep coming in. If anybody ever has a question, they can always check, uh, you know, at the website, uh, you know, the that's scrolling below. And if you have any yes. questions about anything, please feel free to uh, send them there anytime, even after the broadcast. Um, okay. Uh, I got some questions right off. First off, I, I feel really guilty because I saw when you were talking about pink evening primrose mm -hmm. and fruit, I, I got to admit, I've been, I've been guilty of running the lawnmower over those a few, uh, you know, it's just, we it, all do. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it made me think it's like, when did this, uh, when did the assault on native plants begin? When did we, it seems, you know. Uh, <laughs> not I'd be happy to, to talk about that. That's another topic, but yeah, I, that is interesting. And it's actually been going on for hundreds of years here. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's uh, it just seems like, yeah, that's uh, uh, a lot of stuff. Like I was trying to, you know, maybe make it, you know, bring in different areas and make it look like a different place and plant things that we shouldn't do. So, um, uh, some other questions that came in, uh, so I had a question on dirt machines. Uh, and I've heard of this. Uh, my sister, uh, was trying to tell me about this, that on her kitchen cab counter, she has a place where she puts, um, like scraps and that it's a quote unquote dirt machine. Are you familiar with these? Uh, if you're, you know, is this something that, you know, uh, just a small time composting, uh, would you recommend if you live in an apartment, maybe you could, uh, you could put participate this way? So I have all kinds of methods of composting and one of them is uh, Lomi and it's an electric machine that I put the materials in from my kitchen waste and then it will compost it in four hours. And so I, I make up that this is a similar type of machine that, that she has. So that that does produce what comes across as compost, but it's not really Compost actually is, if you look at uh, Deborah's Caldwell's lecture that she gave here in January, compost is actually full of living organisms. Every tablespoon has billions of organisms in it. That that goes through that little processor machine that we have does not have that. Okay, yeah. so it's going to be absent. It's a great way to keep stuff from the landfill. Okay, it. it's a great like, way to do that. I encourage any any way to do that, but thinking that is compost and eh, not really that great of compost. Got it. Good to know. Good to know. Mm -hmm. All right, let's turn to some of the questions. We had a lot come in. Um, uh, this comes from our the Facebook page. Uh, do you know of any native plant gardens in Houston, or what? I know you mentioned them. What native plant gardens in Houston would you recommend? Oh, yes. So the Russ Pittman uh, Park, now that you mentioned that, the Native Plant Society gives the landscaping course, which I think we've got the link for at least the Native Plant Society of Texas. You can find the landscaping course, but Russ Pittman Park, it's off of uh, New Park or New Castle. Um, that park actually has everything for their level two landscaping course. And if you go on to this app, iNaturalist, there's a project you, and you find iNaturalist at Russ Pittman Park. It has all those plants labeled. Okay. They, 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 Mary Spoiler, a friend of mine, had done that project. And so that's a good place to go. Okay. Great. Also, the local Native Plant Society at the, at the Mercer Arboretum, And there are other places. Clear Lake has their own little garden. But we all have different areas that... If you get involved with the Native Plant Society of Texas, your local chapter, that's the way to go. That's the way to go. Okay. 
All right, Leslie had a question. Um, she said, are native plants from non-native nurseries actually native? <laughs> That's the question. And the only way to know is if you have a reputable person on the sale end, okay? I can't mm -hmm. speak for anyone, but you 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 really want to know the source and that's why i recommend sources such as the native plant society they'll be able to tell you where the seed came from okay okay so where the plant <laughs> right and so Mark. one that i can tell you carte blanche is solid it's the audubon native plant nursery at edith elmore you can buy the products online buy the plants online and then pick them up on friday morning you pick it up and so that's that is the real deal I can tell you without a doubt. The others, um, Morningstar Nursery, I know, is totally native, and that's over in Damon. Okay. That's on the southwest side of town. Yeah. And then any of the native plant sales, chapter sales, those will be native plants you can rely on. Perfect. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a lot of questions are coming in now, which is great. Let's get to these. So Dana uh, was asking, uh, how can we plant these flowers without too much uh, ragged, dead-looking areas in winter? Um, HOAs tend to be bothered by the whole yard. That's another thing to consider is HOAs having some very specific requirements uh, and, you know, how that affects native plants. Right. So what I do is I have certified my lawn with the National Wildlife Federation. One of those signs on one, on the slide that showed the pink evening primrose, mm -hmm. in the middle of that is my Native Wildlife Federation certification. This is wildlife habitat. So the HOA can complain. They typically won't unless a neighbor, and I have two neighbors that do complain. And so I'll get little cards from the HOA, and basically I'm in a process of educating them that I'm leaving these purple coneflowers up for seed for the wildlife through the winter. One of the things you mentioned about why did the native plants go away? Well, we like to bring in things that were going to flower through the winter. Well, guess what, folks? Winter is a time of restoration, and our lawns and the wildlife need to be nourished during that. If we rip everything out and put in non-native species, then the wildlife has no food. What would everyone do if all the grocery stores and restaurants disappeared? That's what happens to the wildlife when we put in nat non-native plants. They have nothing to eat, so they go away. Okay. And so it's about education, changing the perspective, right. putting on new glasses like I was talking. So, Robin, what you're saying, I guess, is that all HOAs are responsible for the native plants going <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> we, we as a culture are. <laughs> I know, I know. I, um, I too. I understand because I, I I'm just learning these things. Yes, I, I know it's hard, and it, I love I love that you put it in a, a way that you know your uh, your job is to become the educator. Then, which uh, uh, really I love, and there's obviously science to back it up and information around there. So that's a really a neat way to approach that. Should that become an issue uh, with an HOA or anything like that? Right. So uh, I'm planning. Oh, I, on the HOA standpoint, I'm actually planning to talk with my HOA and I'm rehearsing what I'm going to say because I actually want to complain about the way our lawns are all the way around me <laughs> and, and to give them some of this understanding that we've just been talking about. And imagine if you would a neighborhood that was dedicated entirely to native plants like that was, the, you know, that was the uh, directive of the HOAs. And you'd have a neighborhood full of, you know, uh, uh, pollinators and, and wildlife and birds. And, you know, imagine how, you know, that could be an, a, an amazing place to live. That's right. We could sleep in on Saturday morning. <laughs> right? And no leaf blowers. Let's get really. Right? Let's get <laughs> we don't need them. We don't. <laughs> See, I think that's that's that should be point number one right there. That's there you go. Uh, let's get back to the questions real quick. Uh, Leslie asked, uh, "Are there any native nurseries in the in the northwest uh, of uh, northwest area of Houston? So, any native nurseries in the northwest area of Houston?" And I think you mentioned so some of those ones. Which ones, maybe do you know of offhand that are in the northwest area? So the closest would be the Mercer Arboretum. Okay, that's where the Houston Native Plant Society chapter has its sales. Other than that, since I live in the southeast, you're asking me way out of my my zone. I, I don't know of a native plant nursery there. That's a good question, and I'll ask my friends, but I don't know of a, a nursery that's dedicated to native plants in that area. Okay. Well, we'll put that, if we can later on, we'll put that in the... Uh, and, the and John, I'm not sure if I answered her question about the ragged dead leaf. Did I actually answer that, or did, did I bypass it? 
Uh, we'll go ahead and you know, go bring it up again, if you don't mind. Yeah, How can we plant these flowers without too much ragged, dead looking area? Okay, and so you can trim it. You can make it look neat and still leave some for the wildlife. That's what I do. I try to, I try to find a balance, and that's, that's the balancing act is making it acceptable to the wildlife by having mm -hmm. native plants and then still have it pleasing looking intended, looking tended and not untended. Okay. Right. And so there's a balance. And so it's, a, it's, there's no cut and dry and you have to work with whoever is around you. And I, and I love that you talked about, you're not advocating just going out and, you know, tearing up your entire lawn and, you know, digging no. up everything, but just gradually start working in some native plants in a selective areas, you know, in different parts of your yard. Uh, and it can really just kind of grow on that. And then I think I, if I, here's the thing is if I see something grow, if it, if it grows, it stays. <laughs> exactly. It's the non -native stuff that don't grow that end up, right. you know, going. And we all lose plants. And when a plant dies, consider a native. That's all I'm suggesting. I got it. I got it. I agree. Well, listen, uh, uh, like I said, we have had some amazing uh, uh, facts come at us and this has been amazing. This has been great. Um, one last time I want to promote your green thumb native plant workshop. Uh, this is kind of tell people again, what, what this is and uh, what they, I'm going to pull up that slide again real quick while we're, while yes. you're going into that. Okay. This will be Saturday at 9 AM at the Genoa friendship garden. And we'll be starting in the education building, talking just a little bit about propagating native plants, how to recognize when seed is ready to be harvested, how to clean seed. We'll actually clean two different plants, seeds that I've got available for you. And then we'll go out and we'll, I will show them my native plant landscaping bed that I've been building and learning to design over the last year. Then we will actually go and put some native plants in the ground in the new pollinator bed that we're putting together. So, and the folks will go home with uh, at least one or two uh, native plants that they can take home with them and put in their bed. And I'll have others available too, if they want to purchase for just a small donation. It's going to be a lot of fun. Great. Sounds very good. Well, Robin, thank you so much. I also want to thank um, Aida and Lisa for helping us out on the Master yes. Gardener site and uh, answering some questions. Uh, and I want to remind everybody that next month we have another show on April 18th. Uh, it's going to be tips for great lawns, tips for great lawns. So kind of, I'm sure some of the stuff we talked about, but also maybe some different, uh, uh, some new ideas. So uh, really excited about that. Robin, uh, I can't thank you enough for uh, joining us and uh, all your work on this. And uh, I, I really look forward to the uh, the 25th. I think that'll be a, a lot of fun. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Thanks, everybody, so much. We'll see you next month. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.